Proverbs chapter number 12. I'm going to begin by reading one verse to verse number 18. The Bible says, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Again, there is that speaketh like piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for an opportunity to be in your house tonight. Lord, we're thankful for the singing. Lord, we're thankful for the services this morning. But Lord, you've appointed another time for your people to come. And Lord, you've set the table. Lord, I pray that you'd empty this vessel of myself, Lord. And I pray that you'd pour me out what you put in me. And Lord, help your people tonight. We pray that you'd be with the pastor as he's away. Lord, thank you for giving them traveling mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Now, for those of you that don't know, something about the book of Proverbs, I love it. A lot of people don't like it because either it goes over their head and they don't want to meditate on it for God to allow it to speak to them, or people don't look like the book of Proverbs because they say it's too simple. It's supposed to be the wisest book of the Bible written by the wisest man in the world, and they say it's just it's too simple. It's because they're trying to use man's intellect to understand a God-inspired book. But, in chapter number 12, you're going to find in the book of Proverbs, there are many references to words, to the way that we speak, what we speak, how it is that we speak, why certain people say certain things. And in verse number 18, everybody knows somebody, like the beginning part of this verse says, there is that speaketh like piercings of a sword. Right? Whoever said, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That joker was a liar. Amen. Okay? Amen. On the authority of God's word, there are those that speak, and it's like being pierced through with swords. Words do hurt. Not because the words are hurtful, but because of the intent behind them. There's blessing and cursing in anything. In everything. As a result, the words that could be used to comfort because of intent behind it can leave a wound. That's not just true of wicked people. That's true of God's people. There are people in this room tonight that if they stood up and testified, everybody's got an account of somebody that was in church, somebody that said they loved them, somebody that was linked up arm in arm with them for the cause of Christ, but somebody said something and it hurt them. Now we're not going to get into why it hurt or if they were right to be hurt, that's a whole different story and a whole different message. We're not going to get there. But words do hurt. This isn't talking just about hurt. This is talking about being crippled. I don't know about you guys. I've never had to wake up in the morning with a sword sticking out of me and say, all right, it's time to go to work today. It says, there is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. You know what the pierce means? It goes all the way through. It's not stuck. They didn't poke you with it. It rained you clean through. Right? It cuts you down, in other words. Anybody ever had news delivered? Or anybody ever have an altercation with somebody? Or somebody just blindsides you out of the blue with something that you didn't know was bothering them, and then it changed the way you lived for a little while after? That's what it's talking about. This isn't somebody calling you a bad name out on the schoolyard. Okay, this is someone whose intent was not just to hurt you, but to cripple you. And according to your Bible, there are those that can speak those words that do such that thing. To pierce you through like a sword. That takes you out of the fight. Getting pierced through with a sword could change the way that you live for the rest of your life if you let those words linger. But thank the Lord for the second half of this verse. It says, but the tongue of the wise is health. Now many a time Solomon in the book of Proverbs uses contradictions or contrast to show you the bad of something but also the good of something. Well, what are we discussing? We're talking about words. Talking about speech. The things that we say. Just as somebody can pierce you through, cut you down with words. 
It says that the words of the wise are what? Health. You know what the opposite of health is? Sickness. You know what the words of a deceitful man or the words of a wicked man or the words of someone with ill intent, you know what those will cause you to get? Sick. If you dwell on the words that cause pain, pain can turn into infection real quick. If left untreated, a wound can turn into something that's more than just a little sore. It needs medical attention. Right? Thank the Lord for Neosporin. Right? Hopefully y'all got enough common sense to know if you get a cut, you're supposed to clean it, put Neosporin on it, or some other antibiotic cream. Why? To keep it from going gangrene on you. To keep it from getting infected. Because really the infection's not the problem. They got antibiotics and everything else for that. It's when that infection gets into your blood that it spreads to the whole body. What started with a word can soon cause your entire body to be sick, to be ill. But on the other side, the words of the wise are health. In order to give health, it means, literally, that all the work has already been done. You don't go to the doctor and they say, all right, you got to do back surgery, Brother Phil. Here's some scalpels. Good luck. I thank the Lord they didn't do that for him. He's got steady hands, though. He's a welder. Right, but I can just see the scar now of you making the, the circles from a weld gun. Yeah, that would have been that would have been a sight to see. Right, if you go to the doctor and they say, All right, we've got to do this scan. There's the machine over there. Good luck. Just press that button and then run over there and get in front of it in time. That that's not, that's not health. What's that? That's directions. There's a whole lot of people in this world that want to give you a list of directions to solve your problem but just like Jesus said they're trying to help you with the moat in your eye and they got a beam sticking out of theirs right direction is not health health means that it's already been delivered to where the only thing that keeps it from helping somebody is receiving it right if you go to the pharmacy and they give you a bottle and it says on their instructions you've got it in your hand all you got to do is take it all you've got to do is follow the prescribed treatment. Well, the words of the wise, they add health to those that hear them. Just like you can tear somebody down with words, you can also build them up. The devil is all about discouragement, but yet the New Testament encourages us to do what? Edify one another. Building each other up on our most holy faith. You know how you do that? Through words of wisdom. Which begs the question, okay, what does wisdom mean? Biblically, what your Bible will define as wisdom is that you have an understanding or a grasp of truth. Not the truth that the world knows. Right, a couple of years ago, they, all these people were coming out and saying, well, I'm just speaking my truth. No, there's truth, and then there's fiction. There's things that are true, and there are things that are false. Right? Truth is not up for debate. Truth's always been true, and truth will always stay true. But wisdom is more than just knowing what is true. It is having a command of what is true. Do you find it any surprise that the Bible talks about those with a hoary head or gray hair right, are known to have greater wisdom? You know why that is? They got experience. Some things are just true. And the longer you live, the more you find out them to be more true. Not going off of that logic, but Thad should be the second wisest one in here tonight. That's to make up for the one he didn't do earlier. You're welcome. The right experience of truth. According to the world, you've got to go through a whole lot and make a whole lot of bad decisions in order to even start grasping what is wisdom. They say you can be intelligent. They say you can be smart. You can be learned. But wisdom, it takes a lifetime to develop. Not according to your Bible. 
If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, which giveth unto all men liberally. You know, that means God's no respecter of person. If he gave it to Solomon, he'd give it to you. If you ask for it, and you're in the position to receive it. Not so that you can pound yourself on the chest and say, I'm the wisest one that I know. What would that be? That would be ask and receive not because you ask to consume it upon your own lust. That's prideful. But if you humble yourself and say, Lord, on my own devices, I wouldn't even know which way's up. Outside of the fact that one day you came and found me, reached down into the miry clay and brought me out of where I was, I wouldn't even know that there was a better way. Why? Because we were blind in darkness. The devil in this world had hidden our condition to us. And if you humble yourself and you say, Lord, not for my sake, but for the sake of the name of your Son, for the betterment of those around me, so that I may be a better instrument and a better tool to be used of, I pray that you'd give me wisdom. He'll give it to you. And it doesn't just say that he'll give you some. It says that he gives all men liberally. Why would God withhold wisdom when he tells us to lean not on our own understanding? Trust in the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. Lean not on your own understanding. Ask God for his wisdom. You must have wisdom in order to what? Speak words of health. Unless you've gotten truth out of this book and God's made it come alive in your heart and in your soul, you're not going to be able to use it to help somebody else. There's a bunch of jokers every Sunday, every Wednesday get up and they open a King James Bible, but they don't wield it in wisdom. They don't wield it in humility. Instead, they wield it for their own purposes and what, they do a whole lot of damage with it because they don't rightly divide the word of truth. They don't take it line upon line and precept upon precept. They preach their hobby horses. They preach their opinions, and then they try to find verses that justify what they say, and they take it out of context. Having the truth is not enough. You've got to make the truth a part of you. Well, how do you do that? Well, there's two ways. First way, like we said, you humble yourself, and you let God do the teaching to you. How do you think Solomon received his wisdom? God gave it to him. But God just didn't dump it out of the sky and put it into his brain. Solomon had to be willing to what? Learn to receive it. And then as a result, what did he do? He was inspired by the Holy Ghost, the angel of the Lord that shadowed him. To what? Write it down so it could be preserved. Because he understood that not all men had the time, had the luxury. Solomon, right? richest king Israel ever had blessed by God with peace the only time that we know of in Israel's history where they weren't for a long period of time at war with other nations why because God honored the works of his father David and Solomon's obedience to try and lead God's people as an instrument of God why did he ask for wisdom so that he could judge God's people correctly he said I don't want to judge them on what I think is right and wrong I want to judge them on what thus saith the Lord where do you think he got that wisdom he spent a whole lot of time in the tabernacle spent a whole lot of time in the temple how do you say that brother Jordan because Solomon you go read the account of the Queen Sheba she says she tried to figure out everything all of his servants loved him that was weird most servants don't like kings because kings are brutish, kings are ornery, kings give orders. But no, all of Solomon's men loved him. She said, what makes this guy tick? What makes him so special? And then eventually you get to where she sees him in his countenance as he walks into the temple, and she said, that's when it clicked. Solomon was great because Solomon loved God. And as long as Solomon was small in his own eyes, just like his grandfather Saul, or two kings ago Saul not his grandpa Saul was great when? when he was humble 
The moment that you stop being humble, you don't possess wisdom anymore, you possess opinions. When you think you've got it figured out, you don't have it figured out. But man, think if he stand, let him take heed, lest what? He fall. So these words that are hell, what are the prerequisites? You got to be wise. But you can't be wise without what? Being humble. And even if you're humble, you can't receive the wisdom unless what? You're studious about the things of God. But if you pass all those prerequ prerequisites, and God does give you a little gleaning of wisdom, you can speak health to other people. Your very words may be the thing that keeps somebody going. Not because of yours, but because God put them in your heart. You're just relaying the message. Not because you have great wisdom, but because God's wisdom is far above our own. We understand in part. We see in part through the Word of God, but God knows things that you can never know. God knows the groanings and utterings in a person's soul that they can't even put words to. And if He lays it on your heart to say something, just go back a few chapters and see how valuable a word fitly spoken is. That's what it says, verse number 18. But the tongue of the wise is health. So with the Lord's help tonight, what we're going to teach on is speaking healthy. Speaking healthy. There are many different ways that what you say, if tempered with wisdom and with the knowledge of God, can actually be health to somebody else. One, it has to do with delivery. No one ever helped anybody without being sincere. Sincerity is key. You can't put up a front and then try to help somebody. You can't try to make it look like you've got all of life's answers because usually that turns people off. Nobody likes to know it all. I had to learn that the hard way. That's why Jordan's still single. Right, but you have to be sincere. You have to be transparent. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know why you're wrestling. I just want to let you know that God said, and then deliver the health. If God lays somebody in your heart to give them a call, the last thing you should do, pick up the phone and dial it immediately, you should say, all right, Lord, what do you want me to tell them? Right, there's being the instrument, but then there's being a sharp instrument. There's being prepared. There's going in with your head on straight. You've got to be sincere. You've got to be sharp. But then also, you've got to be silent. He said, well, Brother Jordan, I thought you just said that you could talk. And those words could be held to somebody else. This is true. But in order to offer wisdom, you must first listen to what they're going through. Nobody was ever used to be health to another person without first being willing to sit down and listen. You've got to make yourself available. Not just to God, but to people. You know what part of the ministry and ministering to others is? You've got to get down to where they're at. You can't minister from afar. You've got to get up close and personal. You've got to be silent. When you go to the doctor, the doctor should be doing very little talking at the beginning. Because they're asking you, hey, you got any new symptoms? Tell me what's going on. Describe what you're going through. They may ask clarifying questions. Right? You ever heard this one? Is it shooting? Is it burning? Is it stabbing? I don't know. It hurts. Okay? It hurt. Well, what's it feel like? Pain. It hurts. But they do very little talk until what? Until they understand what it is that you're telling them. How many times did Christ come and people would come and speak to him? He was God. He knew what they needed long before they ever said anything. Go look at the woman at the well. He knew how many husbands she had. 
The one that she was with, he knew all that before she even picked up her water pot to come to the well. Yet he said, I must needs go through Samaria. And he gets there, and what's he do? He sits down on the well. He says, she's coming this way, I'm going to wait on her. Then knowing that she wouldn't start the conversation because she knew that he was a Jew by the way he was dressed. What did he look like? He looked like a holy man. Looked like a rabbi. So he starts the conversation because he knew that she wouldn't. And then what? Then he asks her questions. He listens to her responses. Yeah, he was God. He knew the conversation in infinity past. Knew exactly what she was going to say and what he was going to say back. But what did he do? He let her open up to him. You can't speak to somebody's ears that are stopped up. Sometimes before you can speak health to somebody, you've got to sit down and show them that you're a friend. That you're not somebody there for your own gain. You're not somebody there for selfish reasons. You're not trying to get a kickback or try to get money. Hey, I've got this program that'll help you. It's only going to cost $25,000. I accept cash or check. You've got to be sincere, but sometimes you've got to be, sin you've got to be silent. But then finally, you've got to be sensitive to what the Holy Ghost. Those words that you're saying, if you're trying to figure out what to say, you're going to say the wrong thing. It may be true, may be right, may be correct, but it may not be what God wanted you to say. Right? There's doing things God's way, and then there's every other way. You know why so many so-called churches have a bad reputation? Because they say, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord hath not said. They say something that they've heard is true. They may even believe it's true. But they don't have wisdom on it. Why? Because they're just talking heads. They're puppets. You can't go and repeat everything that the preacher said to somebody the next day and expect it to help them. God may use what you heard at church yesterday or on Wednesday or when you was listening to YouTube or when you took out an old CD or some of y'all still got 8-track players, I'm sure. I don't think we got preaching tapes on the 8-track from here, but I know we got cassettes from way back in the day. You go back, oh, that's good. I want to tell somebody about that. The desire to do it is good. The desire to help is good. But you also have to understand that everything has to be done according to God's timing. If you want to be a help to somebody, learn how to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. When he says speak, speak. And when he says shut up, shut up. When he says don't say what you're just thinking, say this. Don't say it and then go back and tag on whatever you wanted to say before. Be sensitive to God's direction. And if you do those things, you can be health to somebody. What healthier words are there to be spoken than the gospel? Than the words of salvation? You want health? I'll do you better. How about life, joy, and peace? It's called Jesus. Right, speaking words of health to somebody, spiritual health, that's the best thing you can ever give them. But I don't think that this side of heaven will truly understand how much God wanted to use us, but we got in the way. On how much God wanted you to say, He didn't want you to get up and preach to Him. He just wanted you to say it day in and day out, to live it. It's always right. Talk about what Jesus did for you. Not shoving it down other people's throats. But does not say mag magnify his name among who? The heathen. You know who that is? That's an unbeliever. Somebody that doesn't believe in him. Do you know why they don't believe in him? Because either they don't know how to believe in him. They don't think that they need to believe in him. And God may have just sent you by their way. Why? To talk about what you were before he found you and what he's turned you into afterwards and how thankful you are for it. 
You don't have to be jumping down somebody's throat every day to speak health to them. Ye are the salt of the earth to preserve. That in this space of grace that God has given all mankind, that they can believe on the Son of God, you may be the one that just, for a little while, God uses to what? Give them what they need now. So what? God can get them to what they need later. If they do or if they don't, the words are still health. You ever realize that when you go to witness somebody else, you usually walk away feeling better? You say, why is that? Because them words that you're speaking, they're health to you too. It does you good to remember where God brought you from, where He's put you at, how much you don't deserve it. And then on top of that, how thankful you are that He did do it. It's always healthy to put on that garment of praise for you. But when you realize that God didn't call you to praise Him only in His house, but out in the world, to magnify His name to those that need to hear it, that's when you realize that your garment of praise can actually be healthy for other people. I'm not saying go out and cause a big scene every time you pray over your food at a restaurant. Right? But don't be over there and say, Lord, thank you for this food and please let it bless us. And amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, it's powerful. How powerful is it? It can speak health to somebody's very soul. You can be the mouthpiece that God uses so that the Holy Ghost can get a hold of somebody's heart. Sometimes healthy doesn't always mean comfortable. If you've ever had surgery, it's not too enjoyable the day after the surgery or during the recovery process. But what was it? It was health unto you. You were better in the long run. The only reason conviction hurts is because people are stubborn. I truly believe that. The word conviction means that God's trying to convince you of something. You know why you don't believe it? Because you're full of pride, you're full of self, and you don't want to admit that you're wrong and God's right. Conviction doesn't hurt if you just say, yes, Lord. Conviction's not a problem. If when God says, hey, this is what's right and that's what's wrong, if you say, yes, Lord. But sometimes, even though it may sting, it's still health to them. But Brother Jordan, how do I know if, if sting is what they need? God will tell you. We already went over that. You've got to be sensitive. Say what He wants you to say. Because if I said what I wanted to say to people all the time, they'd probably have already killed me. Right? If I said what the flesh wants to say to people, right, I wouldn't be able to get up here and teach with a clean conscience before y'all because you'd think, did you hear what he said to that person the other day? Well, they probably deserved it, so hush. Right? But there is, speaking the health of salvation, there's health of surety. What's that? That's reinforcement. That's comforting. Sometimes God may choose you to be the mouthpiece to voice what? That God's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. That once your boat was in a very similar storm and God brought you through it safely. The boat didn't look the same when it came out the other side, but it's still floating. That even though the seas were high and it rocked back and forth and you didn't have sleep, or maybe like the Apostle Paul... You didn't know whether it was day or night. You couldn't find the moon, the sun, the stars. You were in darkness. Maybe like Job, you looked on your left, you looked on your right, you looked in front of you, and you couldn't perceive what God was doing anywhere in your life. But yet through it all, he had a plan. When Noah got on the ark, he wasn't steering. God did. There was no front or back to the ark. You know what it was? It was just a floating log. Really, that's all it was. Didn't have a rudder. Didn't have sails. What they have to trust that God was going to take them through. And you may think that I'm crazy, but Noah, who had never seen a boat, heard about a boat, built a boat, just doing his best to follow God's instructions. You ever given Lego instructions to a kid and then see what comes out on the other side? 
They was doing their best, but it don't look like what was on the front of the box. I believe if we could see what the ark really looked like, it wasn't seaworthy. You know why it floated? Because God kept it on top of the water. God honored what? Faithfulness. And you may be the mouthpiece that says, hey, I know everything in your flesh is screaming, give up, give in. It's not worth the fight anymore. The struggle isn't going to pay off in the long run. God just wanted me to tell you, it'll be worth it after all. Right? The last mile may have been bitter, but I promise that one day there's coming the end of the race. And that when you cross the finish line, it really will be worth it all. When what? When we see Him. They just sang about it. There's a brighter day coming. Not just because we get to see Him, but because we get to be reunited with those that we love the Lord with along the way. But not just words of surety, not just words of salvation. Sometimes you may be the mouthpiece for words of safety. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Well, if you're anything like me, most of the time, by the time you get through a work week, you feel like just batting up the hatches, right? Going into a bunker somewhere and then staying there until Sunday morning. Then Sunday afternoon, going back to the bunker. Then Sunday night after church, going back to the bunker. And you don't want to come out on Monday morning. Right? We all got to face the world. We all got to face our own flesh. We all got to face those things that we wrestle against, which is not flesh and blood. It's against principalities. It's against powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. What are you wrestling against? You're wrestling against the oppressive nature of the devil and what the influence he's had on this world. And it's a fight. That's why God gave you the whole armor of God. He knew you needed it. But every now and then, somebody just may need someone to come along put their arm over their shoulders and say, hey, for a while, just take a seat. God wanted me to come along and let you know that everything you're doing is right. And the only reason that I'm not tired right now is because somebody came by my way, gave me some Gatorade, some sugary protein snacks, some trail mix, maybe that's what it was. Like God sent somebody my way to speak words of encouragement to me. So for a while, just sit behind me. I'll stand here and I'll take what it is. You're not safe because of me. You're safe because God's got a hedge about you. You're safe because God doesn't let it get to you unless it goes through His hand and the Father's hand first. But for a while, let me bear your burden for you. Everything's safe. Everything's all right. Just take some time to relax, to recuperate. You may be the mouthpiece that God uses to get their minds off of their problems and get, the answer, or get their eyes back onto the person that has the solution to their problems. You know why burdens get heavy? Because they're heavy. They don't call it a burden unless it requires effort to bear it. Otherwise, it's just it's nothing. You know why burdens get heavy? Because they mean something to you. They're important to you. And sometimes when you are feel like you're holding on by the last string of the last rope that you got, you feel like those burdens are going to crush you. But because they're so important to you, you know that you're not going to let go of them. Because those burdens have faces and names and they have souls attached to them. You're not going to drop the burden. So every now and then God just sends somebody by that says, for a while just sit here somewhere safe. He puts you in a cleft and He puts His hand over top of you. Where does He set you? He puts you on the rock. And He sends a partner to come by your way. A Barnabas, a Silas a co-worker, co-laborer in Christ to do what? Just to let you know everything's still safe. 
You can sit down and these burdens aren't going to drop. First off, God's got them. But for a while, I'll take the burden. But what, what do you get out of it? I don't get anything out of it. It's for you. Because God wants you to know everything's still safe and sound. Weather's fine in heaven. You're still on the winning side. Amen. And just to remind you that these burdens are worth carrying. But you just needed a little space. To what? Get your legs back up underneath of you. Catch your breath. Take a nap. Did not Jesus take his disciples into a desert place to separate for a season? Why? So that one, they could recover from what they just did, but two, prepare for what was coming. Because I don't find after Jesus ascends into heaven that they took time off. You know where I find they're at? They're in the upper room. They're putting in labor on their face before God every day. Getting into one accord. Why? Waiting for the Holy Ghost to be come as He was promised. And then once He shows up, I see that they hit the ground running. We can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. But every now and then, Christ wants you to take a seat, take a rest, and you may have the words of safety for somebody else. Nothing else is going to go wrong. It's okay. The world's not on your shoulders. The world's under His feet. It'll be okay. But in the meantime, I'll bear these burdens. So many different words. Words of solace. Words of consolement. Right, words of praise that somebody else needs to hear. They've got a fire shut up in their bones, but every now and then somebody just needs to come by and stoke the fires a little bit. God, as the songwriter said, stirs the slumbering chords again. It's still there. But every now and then somebody just comes along that reminds you how good it sounds when you play it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? These are all words of health. These are things that better people. These are things that spiritually will make an impact for all of eternity. Your words won't pierce them. It'll patch them back together when you realize that you may be the very band-aid that God wants to put onto somebody's life you'll start talking different you'll stop flying off the handle you'll consider your words I mean just go back to verse number 30 of chapter number 11 the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life you know what wisdom tells you? That you need to live a righteous life before God because God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. But the fruit of your life is not for the tree. You've heard me say that. Trees don't eat fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is not for you. It's for those that haven't gotten a taste yet. Because look at the second half of that verse. And he that winneth souls is wise. You want to be wise? Get busy with the Father's business. He's going to show you a whole lot of truth that you can give to a whole lot of people. You know what I have found? I don't know why this is. I don't know if it's because of the way my voice sounds. But we've got a rule at work that if somebody call, calls up and they are being what I have defined is a jack wagon. Okay? Okay? A jack wagon is somebody who, who's acting like an idiot and doesn't want to stop. Okay? You don't have to be loud to be a jack wagon. You don't have to be dumb to be a jack wagon. You just have to be a pain in somebody's rear end to qualify as a jack wagon. If they call up and they don't want to stop being a jack wagon, they get transferred to me. And if I can't get them to calm down, then they get transferred to my boss, who is an ex Marine that is not only a red head, but a red bearded man. So he's full of a whole lot of righteous indignation. Okay? But more times than not, I don't have to raise my voice. If I just talk to them like their problem is actually a problem, and I just let them know, I understand this is important to you. 
They calm down real quick. Sometimes I just got to talk over their head for a second so they realize, oh, this guy might know something that I don't. But I don't do it in a condescending way. Say, well, is it part of this, 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 and this? Well, I, I don't know. Well, can you do me a favor and go find out? Here's my phone number. Call me back with the answer. So many people think that you've got to use the right word. So many times, it's not the word that you say, it's the intent that you say it with. You all know my father. You have heard our pastor preach from behind the pulpit that when he was young, he was hot-headed. That is a true statement. I got worse than that. I inherited his hot head, and then from my mom's side of the family, I inherited my grandfather, the state trooper, the police officer of all police officers. I inherited his hard-headedness. So not only do I fly off the handle, I'm real bad at saying, you know what, maybe I need to slow down a little bit. Right? God's done a lot of work on me. But you know what I've learned? You don't have to get loud to get your point across. You don't have to get nasty to get somebody's attention. If somebody's acting like a jack wagon, doesn't mean that you're allowed to call them a jack wagon. But if you treat people like you actually care about people, most of the time, they can sense that. They can hear it. Not in the word that you say, but how you say it. True wisdom is not knowing the right thing to say, and every, if somebody says this, then I say this. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is being sensitive enough that, one, you care about people. Saved, lost, people that hate your guts, your enemies. God says you should love them. If you're sensitive and you do love them, then you do care. And when you care, you sound different. You listen different. You answer different. True wisdom isn't getting a burden for people instead of people's problems. Too many times we want to swoop in and we want to be the one that solves the problem for them so we get to put on the cape and say that we're Superman. But sometimes people's problems aren't really their problem. They're looking at the results of the problem in their life. If you care about people, God can use you to deal with the problem they don't even know that they have. God can use you as an instrument to show them that there might be a problem that they didn't realize was there. That's speaking health. But show me one spot where Jesus, even when they were beating him, his eyes kept telling them that he loved them. So they blindfolded him. Show me once where somebody came to Christ and he spoke to him in anything other than love. He said, well, didn't he drive the money changers out in righteous indignation? Yes, because he loved his father. And he loved his father's house. And he loved them jokers enough that they knew what they were doing is wrong, but he wasn't going to let them do it that day. I love you enough that I'm going to stop you from doing what it is that you're doing. When you realize that the God of heaven sat down, he could have done that and they'd have disappeared. He could have had the thought and the problem would have been solved. But he sat down and made a three-quartered whip. Why? To show you that he really did care about what he was getting ready to do. He didn't go grab a sword. What did he grab? He grabbed a correction device. If you love somebody, you don't want to pierce them through with words like swords. You want to speak health to them. Sometimes health is correction. Sometimes it's counsel. Sometimes it's just comfort. But speaking those words of health could mean all the difference for somebody when it comes to eternity. Maybe that person's on their way to heaven, but God uses you to what? Rekindle that fire and they go on to do great things for the Lord. It's not about the results. It's because you care about those people not those people's problems. If you care about people, God will use you to help in other people's problems.
God will use you to minister to other people. God will take care of the rest. But true wisdom is not seeing where the person is, but seeing the person. Not seeing what they're going through, but seeing the person that's going through it. And if you talk to that person like you care about them, God will use you to speak health to other people. That's it, Brother Josh. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.